artillery batteries engaging a long-range duel across the river. Skirmishers hide and fire from the marshy ground to the east side of the bridge. Smoke obscures part of the battlefield. Union skirmishers just out of musket range creep forward to take a pot shot before pulling back again. Six Pennsylvania cavalry look on. Looking east toward the bridge along the rebel defensive lines. Confederate skirmishers in the marshy ground watch the advance of the enemy infantry. General Slocum observes the action from the bluff. Looking north across the bridge towards the Murray farm. Brigadier John Newton leads his three infantry regiments towards the action. Looking west beyond the East Road and the Murray farm. A high level view of the contested bridge area. Major Allen Davies marveled at the skill of the captain and crew, the cutter Speedy. After a fast passage from Wickham to Easington, a whole eight-mile voyage taken under an hour, the cutter certainly lived up to its name. We glided to a stop, barely nudging the jetty. Now the Major was sat on a fine horse, with which to continue his journey to Major General Hill's headquarters some twenty-four miles distant at Hampstead. The telegraph office at Easington was even at that moment transmitting to its counterpart in Hampstead, informing them of the Major's arrival and of the dispatches he carried. 2130, 31st of May, 1862, Divisional Headquarters, Hampstead. Major General Dan Hill sat in the meeting with Brigadier Sam Garland, his regimental commanders, and the newly arrived Major Allen Davies. Several telegraph messages lay on the desk before him. It's been a busy day, gentlemen. Tomorrow will be even busier. Dan Hill picked up the messages. The enemy division on the East Road, or rather one brigade of it, advanced to Crow Bridge late this afternoon. The enemy moved up skirmishers and a battery of artillery, both of which have been making a nuisance of themselves. Counter-battery fire has been ongoing throughout the late afternoon and early evening. Brigadier Rhodes believes the enemy is just feeling out his position, but never intent on a full-scale assault. Though they did bring up three full regiments of infantry, some cavalry to support their forward troops. Once the light began to fade... The enemy pulled back most of his troops, but has left behind a large number of pickets, as well as a battery of guns. Dan Hill looked down at one particular message. This from the 6th Alabama. We're still holding the Choke Heights. Seems a resident of this very town managed to scale the northern side of those heights. Not only that, did it with three mules. So much for our belief that it was an impossible climb. We did pass out information that the enemy has a large tent camp set up at the north end of the West Road. All entry into the peninsula is forbidden. He replaced the messages back on the table and looked at the assembled officers and gestured towards the visitor. Gentlemen, this is Major Davies. He's just arrived from the Arrowhead Express. He's confirming what our mountaineering mule driver reported. Some grins around the table. Major, please inform my officers of the latest information you have brought from the mainland. The Major nodded. We have many volunteer spies, as you would expect in Virginia. No one is too happy to see the northern invaders. The Army of the Potomac has struck out southwest and is being watched and tracked by our forces. The exact destination of the enemy is as yet unknown, but our forces are moving to intercept. The Major took a sip of coffee before continuing. The Union 6th Corps, under command of Brigadier General William Franklin, has been tasked with taking this peninsula. Currently, 
1st Division, commanded by Brigadier General Henry Slocum, minus 2nd Brigade, is the enemy force at Crow Bridge. This is very detailed information, Major, said Sam Garland, raising his eyebrows. Major Davies nodded and smiled. The enemy have loose lips, and we have many ears prepared to listen, sir. He has more in store yet, Sam. Dan Hill nodded for the Major to continue. The second division with attached second brigade will begin to move down the west road at 0600 on the 2nd of June. They intend to sweep south with the goal of taking Hampstead and Port St. Charles. They believe most, if not all, your forces will be over on the east road, engaged with their first division. I have provided General Hill with an accurate, as nearly accurate as possible, listing of all the enemy units involved. Dan picked up the sheet of paper, turning it to face the gathered officers. It's a very impressive, if somewhat depressing, list. We guessed correctly what they were up to, Sam. Now we have the makeup of their forces, commanders, and even the start time. We also have a little over 30 hours to meet that threat. The telegraph office at the headquarters will be very busy that night. Very busy indeed. Zero to 45 hours, June 1st, 1862, Choke Heights. Major Gustus gathered up the final sentries covering the eastern side of Choke Heights. A couple of slouch hats and a tree branch that could pass for a musket barrel left in strategic positions among the rocks at the summit. They will be visible against the skyline at dawn for an enemy picket looking up. A lot of six Alabama's non-combat equipment was to be left in situ alongside the campfires that still burned, too risky and potentially noisy to attempt to move in the darkness. The men moved slowly and silently in single file to the western edge of the summit. Major Gustus had a final look back and was satisfied. It would likely be three hours or more before the enemy discovered they had gone. Exactly one hour later in the small town of Stockton, Major Phelan was rising from his bed to organise the move of his battery. The officers and men of Carter's battery had been told to grab a good night's sleep as he intended to move out at 0530 sharp. They would breakfast, limber up the teams and be out on the road at first light. He'd have left earlier, but darkness made the journey for horse teams, limbers, guns and supply wagons around the tip of North Inlet with its sheer drop foolish. He would be of little use to the rest of the brigade if all his guns ended up smashed at the foot of the cliffs. He would be at Crow Bridge by 0730. He hoped that would be soon enough. The arrival of Carter's battery at Crow Bridge is observed and reported by Union skirmishers. 0800 hours, June 1st, 1862, north of the Crow River. First Division begin their attack. Brigadier John Newton's 3rd Brigade, minus 18th New York, in column left of picture, will advance to the Crow River and engage the enemy after an artillery barrage by A Battery, 1st Massachusetts, and E Battery, 1st New York. Skirmishers are out in front. Once the enemy is engaged by 3rd Brigade, Brigadier W. Taylor's 1st Brigade will advance down the road to take the bridge. Skirmishers advance ahead of the column. Cavalry will patrol on both flanks of the advance and can be used to exploit any breakthrough if such is achieved. A formidable attack force. Skirmishers to the fore. Clouds temporarily obscure the sun in this atmospheric shot. 
Union brigades passing either side of the Murray farm. Brigadier Robert E. Rhodes, half brigade, braces for the attack. Carter's battery rushing to take its place in the line. However, Colonel George B. Anderson's brigade, which had departed Clanfield just before 600 hours, was now just two miles south of the Crow Bridge. It was almost 0900 hours before soldiers of the 18th New York, after a careful and stealthy climb, discovered that the enemy had evacuated the Choke Heights. Even from the top, they could see no sign of the former occupants. This was because the 6th Alabama, along with the Flying Cavalry Brigade, were already south of Paytonville and had linked up with 12th Alabama at the junction of West Road and Stockton Road. 